Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 now. He says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. And <clears throat> I want us to take a look at that this morning. And some Old Testament passages that will help to understand it. And when he says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, it can't be. Because in Romans chapter 3, he says that man's born a sinner. Romans 3 and verse 9, he says very clear, clearly that proved before both Jew and Gentile, they are all under sin or born in sin. Since the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, any and everyone who has been born with the exception of the Lord Jesus Christ himself has been born guilty in sin. So it can't be by their works because their works are full of sin. But look at Romans chapter 3 and verse 12. They're all gone out of the way. They're all together become unprofitable. There is none that do of good, no, not one. And so they can't do anything right. Well, works of righteousness would, would be right, but they cannot do good, no, not one. So man cannot do anything right. Now listen clearly. Outside of Christ, I don't care how good a person may seem to the human. God does not accept that at all. They're guilty in sin, and that ends that subject. Then we think of uh, not by works of righteousness which we have done. Man can't justify himself. There is not one ounce of ability in man to do something that would justify or cause himself to be just or right in the eyes of God. I want to spend a moment on that word justify. <clears throat> there is no one that can, 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 that means ability, that can do anything to cause God to see them as just or right. God does not see, uh, receive man as just or right based on anything he does for himself. Look at Romans chapter 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. When he says in the flesh, he's talking about outside of Christ, not a saved individual, that that individual outside of Christ cannot please God. There is nothing that man can do that can please God. Nothing, absolutely nothing. This point needs to be made clear, needs to be received. You do not, as a human being, have any ability to please God in any way. Look at Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6. Verse 6, but we are all as an un, uh, unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. What Isaiah is saying here, man outside of Christ, no matter what he does or presents himself as, is nothing but death. Not receivable by God, must be separate from God, they have no righteousness, no goodness, and outside of God's grace and mercy, they shall perish 
for who they are and what they are. Ephesians chapter 2. Again, we're simply expounding on Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. And man, <clears throat> outside of Christ, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3, Paul writing to the Jews, they thought they were better than the Gentiles. He says, oh, among them all, also we all had our conversation or walk in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. Everyone outside of Christ, that's not been saved by Christ, is the object of God's wrath. He says it in uh, Psalm 5 and 7, or 7 and 5, whichever it is, he's angry with the wicked every day. And uh, hates all workers of iniquity. God will not receive your prayers, your repentances, your walking an aisle, you're getting baptized, you're doing good things. God will not receive any of that, not any of that at all, in reference to your salvation. Look at Proverbs chapter 7. In Proverbs chapter 7 now, and verse 27. Let me start a little earlier in this chapter to show you what he's talking about here. Proverbs chapter 7. Um, and... Uh, it goes back early in the chapter, verse 5, he talks about the strange woman. The strange woman is his use of words to picture the false gospel and the false church. So then come with that to verse 27, her or the false gospel, false church's house is the way to hell. I want you to notice it did not say a way. If it said a way, there's other ways. The way, false gospel, is the way to hell. And so <clears throat> one attempting to come to God on the basis of their righteousness, their works, is doomed to separation from God, is doomed to hell. You can see that also in Revelation chapter 20. So we take a look at Titus 3, 5 again, and sum these things up. And we see that it can't be by our works of righteousness that we're saved, because man's a sinner. He can't do anything right. He can't justify himself. He can't please God. He has no righteousness. He's the object of God's wrath, and is doomed to be separate from God throughout eternity. With that, I want everyone to pause for a moment. And think of someone that you know that's close to you that doesn't know Christ and realize they're headed to hell. That ought to wake us up. That ought to stir us to the very core of our being to realize Outside of, separate, away from this gospel, I don't care how much you love someone, they're headed to hell. And you need to wake up and see that. Any comments or questions up to this point? All right now let's take a look to add to this Micah chapter 7. one of the minor prophets. Seventh book from the end of the Old Testament. I just counted. I think I'm right. Micah chapter 7 and verse 9. 
I will bear the indignation, that's hate, that's furious hate of the Lord, because I've sinned against him, until he plead my cause and execute judgment for me. So what the writer is saying here, what God's word is saying to us is this. The sinner cannot do anything to please God, can't save himself, can't make himself right in the eyes of God, and that includes the walking of the aisle and all the tommy rot that the religious world would try to uh, push off on you as ways to cause God to accept you. You're not accepted except on these two bases alone. Number one, he pleads your cause. <clears throat> Christ died on the cross of Calvary. He entered into the most beautiful time of his earthly existence, life and death, in that during the time of his death, as high priest, first thing he did is he rent the veil in twain in the temple. He went in and by his blood called the names of his father's elect by name under his blood. The picture of this is in the Old Testament. The high priest once a year would enter into that holy of holies, but he didn't take the curtain aside. He'd crawl underneath. Christ didn't need to crawl. And as the high priest then went in, he called the names of the people, tribe by tribe, and placed blood, tribe by tribe, for the pardon of those people. Christ, as the high priest, in the time of his death, entered in, as I said, ripped that veil in twain, entered in and placed his blood by name for each and every one of his father's elect. They thereby were pleaded for by Christ. The executing judgment, the father executed judgment upon his son on the cross of Calvary. All that was due the elect God laid on his son blow by blow. That's the pleading the cause. That's the executing of judgment. And unless that was performed for you, you'll not only bear the indignation now, but forever. That's why I preached recently, how can you know whether you're an elect of God or not? Now turn to Job chapter 9, right before the book of Psalms. Job chapter 9, and I preached this recently also. And Job is saying, <clears throat> there's no daysman betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. Here's the concept of the daysman laying his hand on both. Christ dying on the cross of Calvary is between his father and between fallen man. <clears throat> he, he's interceding to the father for certain of fallen man laying his hand, which speaks of righteousness. He's declaring his righteousness to his Father for these particular ones for whom he is dying. And you know he's not dying for everyone. He's dying specifically for his people. And in that process, lays his hand or his righteousness, declares his righteousness to his Father again, name by name as he's on the cross. And so, look at your outline. 
there is a daysman, and his name is Jesus Christ the Lord. He did plead your cross, your name on the cross. Judgment was executed upon him, his blood shed for his people. And he declares his righteousness to his Father. Now, the declaring of his righteousness is no trite or unimportant or trivial matter. There must be holiness or no man shall see the Lord. The scripture says it this way, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. It's the same word as righteousness. Without righteousness, we have none. I showed you that earlier in Isaiah 64 and other passages. We have no righteousness of our own. Consequently, there must be righteousness for us, substitutionally by the Lord Jesus Christ. He declares his righteousness in our behalf, and the Father receives us based on the righteousness of Christ alone. That's why salvation is all by grace. Any comments? Any questions? Thanks for your time.